Fáilte Róaf a leg a Carta. The 1981 hunger strike was a defining moment in Irish history, and the courage and sacrifice of the 10 hunger strikers is readily recognised, not just across Ireland, but throughout the entire world. Here in Blahi we always remember with great pride volunteer Thomas McElwee and volunteer Francis Hughes, cousins and comrades both from the townland of Tamladuff, who gave their all both outside and inside the jail. I am privileged to have known them both. They were very sound men, committed 100% and knew what they were about. Their sacrifice drives me on every day to keep working to bring about the Ireland that they gave their lives for. In May we paid tribute to Francis in an online commemoration. Today, in the same way, we reflect and remember the life of Thomas McElwee. A son, a brother, a friend, a comrade, and so much more. It's 40 years and yet it seems just like yesterday. First Yid Bas, our son Searshin Hearn. Niaka Shiv Alagant Arish. Fair Bua. We we seal evening hugging and show no a Malachi of us be beyond spree hugging heart and cheer show of us when the the park and the of us the shock show the childlock more hugging of us be the sessions hugging of us beyond crack hugging listen listen to Brinta we we had a great time as a family together and we were very committed and a loving family where we had great experiences around about locally and in the, the local this is a farming community and we worked locally for farmers and and we had bicycles and we cycled here we cycled there and we, we have plenty of good fun though if Thomas had a big interest in stock cars and fixing cars and he liked getting into into the nitty gritties of a car, taking it apart and, and reassembling it again. So, and other things he had been at would have been. I remember my mother trying to get us involved in piano lessons, and she brought bought a piano and brought the piano to the to the home, but the piano wasn't tuned properly. So it was left in the shed for a while, and Thomas and myself got at it and dismantled it <laughs> completely. <laughs> but we couldn't get it together again. So that was it. Well, it. My mother always referred back to that time. But we was a, things were scarce you now and the, growing up you now and with my father worked he was a very hard worker, you know, and a builder. He built this house himself you now and he had a great garden here and grew vegetables and Thomas and myself helped in the garden and we've got various tasks in the field. We have a little bit of land here as well, so we, we kept animals and looked after the animals and stock. And we had uh, been cutting hedges and doing the the usual chores about the, 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 the fields and what have you for my father. Hard work you know, for young lads, but we, Thomas was a very hard worker you know, and, and was selfless. You know, he always would have put his heart into anything that he'd done and had plenty of time for other people and helping other people out. Thomas and Francis were bonded together and grew up together. We worked the fields together, worked the farms together, helped them. Francis grew up, become a painter, went around painting houses and had crack and went off at the weekends having, having he had a car, drove here, drove there whenever he got a chance and Thomas was was the same who we went to dances and maybe picked up Francis and picked up a few other lads and headed up to Pomeroy, Gorchin, up into Tyrone there, followed the big country and western fans. I was never a country and western fan now, but I was, <laughs> I was sort of a, a, he was a Philomena Begley and the, uh, the usual, the, so they went to all the country and western dances and around about and uh, of course the UDR was waiting along the roads for them whenever they, they took different side roads and what have you to avoid them. And what have. The, the IRA in this area would have uh, been very mobile and they operated through stealth you know, and 
surveillance. You know, they had a heavy surveillance and communication network and uh, through the local network and they were able to work and pass information together you know, and, and were able to find out the movements of the, the English as they, as they come into the area and they knew where their presence were and when, what parts they were, they were travelling and what, which roads they were travelling on. They are the people who used their, their superpowers, their military might, their, their financial reserves to try and break young lads like myself, Thomas Francis Hughes, Dominic McGlinchey, only young lads, 23 years of age, 24 years of age. And if you look around today and see 24 years of age and throw them into the same circumstances, what have you? you know, and you, The mind boggles. It's common knowledge you know, that, that we were both arrested and, and taken to, uh, to Crumlin Road Jail and we were attacking economic targets in, in Balamina at the time. Now, that, was the, that was what the, the whole operation was. And the, Thomas and myself both were suffered injuries at, at, because of the explosion. And Thomas lost an eye and, and he went on to Musgrave Hospital and had major operation, major surgery to save the, the, his other eye. And at, after the operation and all, he was taken to Crumlin Road Jail and joined myself and his other comrades in, on remand while we waited the Diplock courts. As Republican prisoners, and for, first and foremost, no, we, are, we were Irish, Irish men and, and women uh, and Long Cash and Armagh who stood up against the criminal regime of the British government. In, in the north of Ireland and we were subjected then to they tried to subject us to criminal status and and put a criminal stamp upon us and we knew that we were political and we're, we had political objectives and there wasn't a criminal bone in our bodies. My brother then went on like his fellow comrades we joined in the blanket protest and we stood on the blanket protest together, a united group of men, and we suffered dearly because of that, because of that we stood up and said that we were not criminals. We were, we were beaten and dragged from cell to cell, from one week to the next. And during that time, we didn't let our side down and we didn't deny who we were. We stood, we stood gallantly together and the hunger strike should never have happened and the only reason why the hunger strike did happen is because the failure of the British politicians, the same tactics and the same deceit and, and that the British government use in their strategy, their brinkmanship in Europe at the present minute, they are doing the exact same thing and that they have done with the blanket protest and they first get an agreement then they, they, they deny that they have got an agreement, then they come back in again. And this whole thing went on. We, Bobby Sands and our command structure, met with the authorities on numerous occasions inside and tried to negotiate terms for the prisoners without going to the full extent of, of hunger strike. We tried everything under our power to avoid hunger strike. But at the end of the day, we realised that the ultimate sacrifice for us was that either you'd be left in your cell to suffer mental and physical torture for the rest of your life or stand up together as, as a group. And we knew that, that part of our struggle was the struggle on the outside as well. And, and that copper fastened our, our, our strength and, and made, us, made us more aware and at, at, as young men, we were on the battle line. We were we were on the edge of the battle. We were in the front line at the time, and the media and the politicians put us on the front line. We were, were brothers together, no one. Every every fellow that died on the hunger strike, direct was a direct effect on emotionally and and physically no, on ourselves. No, we were locked 24/7 
in a cell with no furniture, no, no nothing, no television, no books, no nothing. And you had the full emotional pressure of that to deal with at the time. And we, we were, it's, it's like losing a brother every day of the week. No, that's the way it, it went. No, a fellow soldier and comrade. And even today, no, I, I it's, it's, it's not often I can speak. No, I, not, ne never mind to a camera. That I can see Bobby and Patsy just as standing beside me, just as, as as you stand there with the camera in your hand, and it's that's we were part of that struggle, and as brothers together we stood together, and we we, we were on the front line emotionally, and, and it's tough, very very tough. Time Thomas died, no, I I, I the. I tried. I applied for a visit a few days before, the, and I've been trying for a visit. And they said you're only entitled to a visit once every month. And they wouldn't let me see my brother know at, at any time before that. And they said you have to go through. You have to see the governor. Wait till the governor comes around the ring and ask him for a request. And they put you through performances. To, so a few days before he died, he says, "Do you want to see your brother?" I said, "Of course, I want to see my brother." And uh, and he took me down to cell 26 and out, out of the, the cell and I says no he says no put on that uniform and I says I'll not be putting on the uniform he says well you're not seeing your brother then and he took me back and put me back into the cell again and I, I says, says fuck you no one and went, went back to the cell and I says I'll not, not be going to see anyone with fucking a criminal's uniform on and the, the the time when my brother died the the screws come back round the cell. He says, "Your brother has died. Do you want to identify the body?" And that's that's the, the way you put it. You no, know, and, and there was no priest or nothing. He'd come up. He says, "Do you want to identify the body?" And the first thing that hit me, you no, know, my family's going to have to come in here to identify him. And I said, I'd, I'd rather than have my family come in, I'll I'll go myself. And they had a civilian. They had the civilian clothes. They had the the, the you prison clothes and sort of semi-civilian clothes that they wanted us to adopt and they gave me that to put on and they went over at the time. It's, it's, it's all, the, the whole feelings, you know, it's, it's, it's as if I was floating, you know, as my, it's, it's as if I was floating and I, I can I can remember coming to the house, you know, and I can't really remember you know, leaving, leaving the, the cache, you know, or who picked me up at the time or, you know, but I remember just coming in the door and, and meeting the, the members of the, the American, the Indian tribe. And, uh, I think it was Wally Feather at the time and uh, another chief from the American nations, one of the, and they greeted me at the door of my house and I thought it was very a spiritual occasion at the time. And it's, I just, the, the whole memory is, all I can do is, is see, see it on TV, you know, I can't, I can't say that I can, I have a physical, or. A, Feeling of it, no. 81 was, it was a, one of the most devastating periods of my life, and, and the, I would say it's the most devastating, one of the most devastating periods in Irish history. And I, unfortunately, the British caused it as they could, it could have been avoided. Could have, politicians could have avoided it, and it, it should never have happened. That's basically, it should never have happened. So farewell to Belahi Likewise time to dawn And the green hill of Delhi The tide dearly long My thoughts return to you From my dark head 
of Sardari. We marched and we drilled to our exploits in action. So farewell to the lucky. Likewise, time to and the green hills of Delhi. The Well, Thomas and I grew up together, sort of lived next door to each other. Um, my family came to live next door to him when I was about 10. Um, Thomas was six months older than me, so I kind of looked up to him as a big brother. Um, he was happy-go-lucky. Um, he, was, he was a good friend. Um, he made friends easily. We had the whole of the parish as our playground. Um, from Tamla Duff and Scribe all the way to Church Island and, and New Ferry. Um, we were seldom out of each other's company. Um, now we went to different schools but sort of evenings and weekends and summer holidays we were always together. Um, getting into sort of the odd bit of mischief um, but nothing sort of serious. There was always neighbours to keep us in check uh, and remind us to behave ourselves. Um, but uh, I remember him as being, um, as I say, sort of happy-go-lucky, full of fun, full of life, um, practical joker. Um, but there was also a serious side to him as well. Um, and that, I suppose, that made him stand out from the rest of us. You know, it made him stand out from the rest of us teenagers. He was, he was a bit more mature and I think sort of people respected him 
that bit more for that. Um, but you know, we had we had great times together. Um, as I say, always in each other's company. Um, we'd go to dances together. Th Thomas was uh, very fond of cars. Um, he liked sort of cars. He um, he bought a car once uh, with the intention of fixing it up and selling it. Um, so he arrived home one evening with this car and uh, his brother Bendick and I spent all day the next day sort of washing it and cleaning it and so on. And Thomas came home that evening and told us he had sold the car. So he'd sold it and made a profit, but I mean, we were never paid for the valley service. Um, but and then he had, uh, the, the, there was another old car he had once uh, and the brakes didn't work very well in it. Um, and in order to stop it when he would drive around the back of his house he had to come down through the gears and then uh, literally just let the car run into the wall to stop it. Um, so three of us were in the car one day, Thomas and Bendigo and myself, they were in the front seats and I was sprawled across the back and uh, so as we came up we hit the wall as usual uh, but the two seats weren't, the two front seats weren't properly attached to the floor so the seats went up I rolled under the seats, the boys came back on top of me, um, they were laughing too much, I was getting crushed to death, um, they were killing themselves laughing. Um, I think the, the thing about Thomas, like I said, he, he, was, he was more mature than the rest of us, um, and he, you know, as well as the practical jokes, he could have sensible conversations about a whole lot of things. And I mean, I do remember having conversations about, um, you know, things like apartheid, things like you know injustices in parts of the world you know i suppose you know at that time in our lives you know the late 60s um, was the first time we had television so we were able to see other things that were going on in other parts of the world and then you know within a very short time it all started to happen here as well so you'd be watching tv in the evenings and sort of seeing civil rights marches and seeing how the police responded to those and you just knew that it wasn't right um, and then, you know, again, not long after that, you started to have a military presence. You know, there were helicopters. We got, you know, stopped at checkpoints. Soldiers got on the bus and searched school bags. And we knew, we knew that was wrong. We knew that was wrong. Um, people shouldn't be treated like that. Um, people ought to be treated as equals. Um, and... I think as time went on, you know, through our teenage years, um, I noticed Thomas, I said before he was sort of very mature, but I noticed him becoming um, not exactly withdrawn, but a bit more, a bit more serious about things. Um, now, I don't know sort of, um, you know, sort of the, the circumstances around um, him joining the Republican movement. But, you know, there, there was a situation that prevailed that really, you know, what you would call swoop and scoop, you know, the army would sort of come into our area and it happened very, very frequently, you know, several people sort of being arrested and questioned and so on. And in fact, you know, Thomas and I were both arrested uh, at one point. Um, you know, the soldiers and the police came into my house and, you know, they... Um, picked me up and sort of, you know, I was taken to Macrofelt Barracks first of all and then to Ballykelly. Um, the funny thing was, um, as I was leaving my house surrounded by soldiers, um, I could hear um, what was going on down at Thomas's house because his family had a couple of um, geese and, uh, you know, for, for anyone who lives out in the country, um, they'll know that geese can be even more um, aggressive than guard dogs. So Thomas was telling me later just about, you know, seeing a couple of soldiers getting chased around the yard and these geese, geese sort of chasing him, or chasing the soldiers. Um, but it, you know, that was funny, but what was happening wasn't funny. Um, on that occasion, as I say, we were both taken to um, Bally Kelly along with some other uh, local fellas. A um, couple of them went on to Long Kesh. Um, I was released that morning. I wasn't even questioned. I was just, and I still don't understand to this day sort of why that happened. Um, Thomas was kept for three days. Um, and from then on, he didn't really talk about it. Um, and I respected that because, you know, I didn't know if he was involved in anything um, 
but at the same time, you know, I didn't want to know. Um, that was his business. Um, but I would say that, you know, he was someone who was very determined, had a strong sense of social justice, uh, a strong sense of right and wrong. And I think he genuinely believed that, um, you know, people had the right to be free from any kind of oppression. Um, I can honestly say there was no hint of sectarianism in him. Um, you know, uh, we had neighbours of all sorts. Um, Thomas was friendly with the neighbours. They liked him. Um, you know, I mean, I, I know that at one point, for example, he worked in the grounds of Lord Maiola's estate. And I know from very good authority that um, Lord Maiola rated him very highly. You know, former Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. Um, but there was something about Thomas's character that, you know, he was likeable, he was friendly. And I think, you know, um, from that same source, I've heard that, you know, even though Lord Maiola sort of didn't agree with Thomas's politics, I think he thought that at least he was principled enough to sort of make a stand for what he believed in. I, I heard that Thomas was going on hunger strike from his sister. Um, that was in June. Um, and because of what had happened already, um, you know, because four hunger strikers had already died, I just thought Thomas was going to die as well. And I thought that that was, you know, because of the intransigence of the British government. Um, I just thought, you know, these are young men and women who um, have been through sort of an, un an unusual and irregular um, court system and in prison. Um, if it hadn't been for the circumstances, um, I doubt if any of them would ever have been involved in anything sort of criminal. Um, but I knew, I, I knew as soon as um, Nora told me, um, I knew he was going to die. Um, and that was, I think, because I knew he, if he applied himself to something, um, he did it 100%. Um, he would stick by his comrades, he would do what he had to do for them. Um, because I, I mean, I saw that as his friend, you know, he, he, you knew Thomas would look out for you. Um, you know, he was always that big brother character, do you know? Um, so I wasn't surprised that he went on hunger strike, I wasn't surprised that he died. Um, but, you know, I think it's probably one of the most horrible experiences that I've, that I've personally sort of lived through. Um, to think that someone that I knew could be so dedicated, so committed to do something that I couldn't even contemplate doing. Um, and I mean, I, I think about him every day. Um, not just on his anniversary. Um, I think about him every day and I think, what would he be doing now if he was alive? You know, would he be married? Would he have children? What job would he be doing? Would we still be friends? Uh, you know, I hope so. I hope so. Um, yeah, there's, there's something, there's something about that sort of period in our history that sort of, even though sort of 40 years ago, um, it's still nearly impossible to talk about.
yeah, when I think back of uh, the movement in general, um, in the Balahi area, but particularly whole South Derry area, in the, seven, 19, the mid 70s, 76, 77, 75, and that, uh, collectively it was like a, a strong Republican family. And you had people like Thomas and uh, Dominic, Ian, Frank, Benedict, Jerry Scullion, loads of lads were about. But they acted like one big family. Um, the area itself in general was very, very active on the, the military front. Um, and you have to bear in mind that uh, geographically, we, we were centred right bang in the middle of Ulster, so there's no getting away. You couldn't just jump into the motor and get over the border. You had to make do with people around in your own area. And the doors were open. A lot of doors were, were open for us guys. And that was why I think that we survived uh, so long. And even up to the present day, that camaraderie would still be there among our own people. Um, very, very Gaelic, very, very grounded, knew where they were coming from. But um, in 76 then we were, um, there was a lot of activity in this area, South Area in general. But we, myself and Thomas and Benny and Shoma Peak, were part of a, a, a bombing mission in Balamina. Um, bomb exploded prematurely in the car. Uh, there were four bombs in the car, one went off prematurely. I got a gallon of petrol around me, we were all badly injured in the car. Um, but we managed to get out and we thought we were going to get away and stuff. I remember trying to get down through the car park. I remember seeing police with guns and stuff. Uh, I remember seeing Big Tom Stanton just covered in blood. And he, he was shouting, I can't see, I can't see. After that, everything personally speaking becomes a bit of a blur. Um, we end up in Ward 18 in Musgrave Hospital. And then through the whole prison system, uh, Thomas and I ended up in A-Wing in the Crumlin Road. And... Sort of looking after each other and stuff. Um, that was a first experience meeting guys from Belfast and Derry and Tyrone and all over the north. Um, it, was, it was a completely new experience for us. But I remember Thomas and Ewing, and he ended up in a cell with a guy, uh, Mickey Lenehan, from the Antrim Road. I'm sure Mickey's still about, but the two of them grown really, really well. But I'll tell a bit funny yarn about Thomas. Uh, in early, early days in the Crumb, we were there was different girls were coming up to see different fellas and stuff, and that was the usual cracking with their pen pals, and that was all there was. But there was one girl in particular whom I won't name in case she sees this, we'll just call her Miss X. And I had a wee bit of a fancy for her, and uh, Thomas told me, oh, he says, uh, she's great with one of our girls. And uh, I tell you what, she says, you write out a wee letter, and I'll bring her out in the visit, and I'll make sure she gets it. And she says, and she might, no, she might come up in the visit. So I wrote a wee letter out to her, and give it to Thomas, and Thomas took it out in the visit. Or I, thought he did and uh, that was okay the following visit there was a reply back from her and uh, oh I noticed you now outside and just I've seen you one night at Money Glass Dance Hall and I was hoping you'd come and dance with me uh, I said maybe sometime I'll you know, go up and visit you uh, I got the letter on me and I showed it to Tom said this is great woman's really interested Tom said I wrote another one says get her up in a visit so I wrote it another letter and I wanted her up in a visit and what I, what I didn't notice was on, when she was supposed to come on the visit that she was busy that day, or she wouldn't be home on time, or she couldn't get the day off. And that went on for two or three weeks. Nice of Thomas, just this, this woman, I don't think she's going to come on the visit at all. And then her letters were getting quite romantic, but kept avoiding the visits. But I just got the stage where Thomas couldn't hold back any longer. It turned out that Thomas actually was Miss X. I was writing to Thomas all along, and he was replying back to me. So it was all in good taste. It was, it was funny at the time, but that was a type of humour of uh, Big Tom. We actually never called him Tom when I think on it. He was he's actually to the country fellas, he's just known as Thomas. But um, I always thought he was a step ahead of myself personally and a lot of the other fellas. Uh, I remember even in the crumb and despite all the security and the injuries and stuff, he was mad looking for a way out to see if he could escape. And he'd been examining the bars and watching the screws and stuff and uh, the, the escape thing was always in the back of his head. Uh, when we ended up then going through the whole... Um, uh, through the court system, we ended up then in the hitch blocks. And Thomas and Sean then went on to the blocks ahead of myself and Benny and Chims O'Connor. Uh, because of our age, we got Secretary of State's pleasure. And Thomas at the time got life. So he was taken down to the blocks ahead of us, and I think he ended up maybe in hitch four. But the rest of us ended up in three. But in 79, I think it was 1979, they moved Bobby and the Dark and the Credum come up into hitch three. 
And at this time, I think, we're trying to break the prisoners. H3 was the worst of three blocks. The, because we were the youngest of the prisoners, the brutality never stopped. So it was that background that, that the Dark and Bobby and Tom uh, back that they all landed up until uh, three. So I hadn't seen Thomas in, in, a, in a good while. And when he came up in that three, it was great to see him again. And at this time, there was changes in him. And it was like, he was really stuck into the Gaelic and the Irish language. And um, the bond was still there. That camaraderie that we had in the outside in our own area, it was still very much there. Uh, he got stuck into the Irish. In fact, he was very, very good at the Irish. Um, and he would have used Irish as his first language rather than his second language. And as I said before, it was quite a spiritual religi religious side of him. Um, so like, during the whole, the whole hitch block thing, uh, Thomas would have been, he'd been known to be quite a tough sort of a guy and uh, he just took no nonsense at all from the, from the screws. Um, he didn't go look in trouble, but the screws come to him with trouble, he, he dished it out to them. He didn't, he didn't stop. There's no back doors, they just bang. And uh, there was more than one occasion like he, he had a screw, he had it well earned. And I told the story before about him coming out of the canteen, um, I was in the cell with Bobby at the time. And we were coming from Mass and the screws had been searching us. We were just wearing a pair of trousers or strides as we called them. But they'd been searching the, the trousers and then some of them had been searching their hair and uh, trying to stick their fingers into their mouths. And one screw um, who was in our block, a big guy, Devlin, he was sticking his fingers into their mouths. But Bobby, he got up the door and shouted out in Irish, uh, telling the Kivador, like Johnny Cardock, the screws are searching and stuff. But when, come to, when Thomas came down the wing, myself and Bobby at the door, and we were looking out, and we knew what was going to happen. And Thomas stood the arms out, and the screws searched him up and down and stuff, and he went to put the hands in Thomas's mouth, with the fingers in his mouth. And Thomas stood back, he just went back again, and just bang, bang, bang. He just flowed a stream of punches in the screw. So the big screw, he dropped to the ground. And I remember Bobby saying, oh, for fuck's sake, we're, we're all going to get killed here. But the screws got Thomas and they took him to the boards, but they never touched him. They, never, uh, they knew that he would hit them back again. So they took him away for maybe a, a week or two, then he came back up again. Um, and, the, uh, and the hunger strike uh, wasn't any surprise to us that he had put his name forward. And he was on the 30 strong group that were on hunger strike um, in support of the first hunger strike, because he was, him and Benny both were part of that group. So when come the second time around, like Thomas had his name down from day one. And when Bobby was picking his men, he knew when he was picking Thomas that Thomas would be there to the to the, the, the bitter end. Um, all the things about him, he, he was the worst singer in Ireland. He couldn't bloody well sing to save himself. And we had all the sing songs and stuff. And I, my singing was every bit as good as Thomas. So Neither the two of us could sing. But I can't even remember what he sung, but he was just he was an awful singer. And he knew it. And uh, some of the times, if he was asked to sing a song, he'd get up the door and he'd just bang the piss pot against the door and shouting and, you know, acting idiot and stuff. You wouldn't have seen Thomas without his, his prayers and his... Uh, Rosy beads. He was quite spirit and quite religious. Um, and I think that would have given him the strength plus his, his republicanism through the whole blanket and the hunger strike and that. Um, I wasn't, it, says it was no surprise to us when he put his name forward at that time and, and Bobby knew who he was picking. He had his whole team around him. Uh, the morning he went on hunger strike, or the night before it arrived, we had a bit of a sing song for him and he got up and he said a few words and everybody wished him the best and then the screws kept in the wing for about three weeks 21 around 21 days three weeks they kept them and that morning then he'd walked up the wing and he come to i was in the cell with a big rocky raw at the time and he came up to the door the, the door and uh, had his last yarn last talk which was quite tough at the time and then through the gates at the bottom of the wing so he went up through the circle to the, the main gates and the screws then put him into the van and i can see him yet just come down the van gone down between the two wings of the block and they had the clenched fist up on the two sides, everybody's all cheering him and shouting him on. So um, we tried to communicate as best we could with him during the hunger strike and that was through the different clergy, um, through families and visits and stuff and we were getting an up-to-date report on his, the weight he had lost. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, because Tom's had one eye, he wasn't getting the headaches that some of the other guys were getting and uh, the doctors put it into something to do with the vision. And I think he was maybe spared that a wee bit. But in the morning, he died on a Saturday morning, I think it was around about 11, around 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And I had a visit that morning and 
we hadn't we didn't know he, uh, that he had died, but he had just he had died under about eleven or so. But I was on my way to the visit, and I remember the screws saying, "Oh, there's Scullion, there's McLeod's friend," and I was just wondering what like, that was unusual. And then when I got to the visits, the visitor told me he says uh, the whole chat is out in the visits that Thomas McLeod has just died. And I said, "Well, we haven't heard it." And then the chat then really started going through the visits that another man had died, Thomas had died. So it was, it was quite a shock. Um, it really knocked, like, because when I think back of, of Thomas, like, and him dying, and Frank dying before it, and us coming from such a small, close-knit area and community, which is still close-knit and still quite Gaelic and, and, and uh, Republican, and it was like losing um, a, a family member, really. So after uh, I came back up into the wing, and then the chat then had come into the wing, I think the news had maybe reached the wing before I did, that Thomas had died. But um, all these snippets about him, uh, I remember when the two of us were in Musgrave, the Musgrave Hospital Ward 18, and that was, well, was the security ward. And he was in a ward next door, a room next door to me, we were in the one ward, but he was in a room next door to me. And there was a wee nurse, and she would bring in wee notes between the two of us. And she agreed to do it as long as we weren't up to anything. And, and then I remember on one occasion, uh, a soldier shown a wee bit of humanity, I have to admit, and that was he let Thomas come out of his room and over to the glass door of my room, and I couldn't get out of bed, but he opened the door and let him talk through to me. And that, that was totally unheard of. They didn't do that, but they let the, the soldier, the Brit, he let Thomas come out and talk to me. So that was the first time I had seen him. And I remember looking at him, and he had, he had the artificial eye on, and the face was scared a bit. Uh, as I said, I couldn't get out of bed uh, to go and see him. But... Um, yeah, when I think on it now, um, I suppose 40 years later, and really we were a very, very tight-knit group locally here, and you know, we didn't just lose two volunteers, we lost two brothers, like the members of our extended family at that time. And uh, as I was talking to a friend recently, and uh, he pointed out, he said, you know, well, a lot of you guys were caught in different counties. You weren't just all operating in South Derry. Uh, I know Ian was caught in Armagh, us boys were in, in Antrim and so on and it wasn't just uh, I know a family in South Derry that was looking after us, there was a, there was a, there was a wider family. I know there's certainly a lot of connections in Tyrone and, and uh, even in Armagh where South Derry boys were, were staying at and based at. Uh, Donegal as well. I know one of our, our party that day was with us in, uh, in Ballymena. Ended up in Donegal and I remember uh, in recent years came up to good friends of mine in Donegal and it turned out this was the first place that a friend uh, went to when he, when he went on the run it was with a, a very good family in, in uh, the Dunlow area but um, so we're really an extended family and that bond still remains today and as I was saying to this friend of mine the other day you know some people uh, they had a the choice to take part in the armed conflict in the war at the time and they choose not to do it and the same people also had a chance to contribute to the Peace with Justice programme and they've still they still refuse to do it. But they can go ahead and they can, you know, they can say what they want about A, B and C. But um, people like Tom had taken the uh, the military angle, but when people look at the sacrifice he paid at the end as with his with his own life. And then when they look at the last thing he wrote, um, I, I, it's in public domain, it's called My Dying Wish and how he wanted Catholic and Protestant and the British. He wanted to make peace with everyone. He wanted them all to live together in peace and harmony. And he said himself he'd like to be a social worker among the people and to bring them all together and show them that a one Ireland was, was a way forward. Uh, the, way, the, uh, the only way we can get a, a, a justful, satisfactory settlement. But th that's, that was Thomas. Um, the funny side, the serious side, has, has thirst for, for the Gaelic, has strong faith in, in his religion and the Ireland that he would have wanted to see and he he, he, uh, he laid his life down for it and, and that was it and it's, uh, it's a big loss and I think today when I look around us but, but few of us have survived and come this length that's a big loss we could do with people like Thomas McElwee today and Frank Danny Morrison um, was in charge of well, he had a particular job at the time, um, and that was to communicate with the prisoners on hunger strike, uh, in the first hunger strike, 
and in the second hunger strike and the outside leadership. And uh, during the first hunger strike, uh, the prison administration banned Danny from the prison, from visiting the prisoners. And then I was asked to take on that responsibility, which is, which is what I did during the second hunger strike. So I visited, um, there were 10 hunger strikers in total who died, three NLA and seven RA volunteers. And of the seven RA volunteers, I visited six of them. Uh, four of them in the prison hospital and two of them in the ordinary visits and um, so um, and to say that it was uh, uh, looking back on it um, it was at the time you were on automatic pilot in terms of your emotions because you were given a job to do it was a difficult job to do but you had to do it um, and you had to, to visit the prisoners with their families because visits were limited in number um, and the lads were on hunger strike and so their, their their life clock if you like was taken away and so the, the families which when I look back on it were very generous with their time because they gave uh, me um, space to visit uh, their relative while that while that relative was um, was, was down on hunger strike and so therefore a member of the family who could have been visiting them uh, gave way uh, to me uh, and to the movement. And I think that that was, was, was typical of the generosity of, of the families at the time. But um, specifically we're, we're, we're paying tribute today to Tom uh, McElwee. I think I visited him twice. Um, but when I think about him, um, uh, on the 40th anniversary of his death I think particularly of his family his parents and his family and um, what they were going through uh, at that particular time because um, you have to remember that uh, Tom McElwee is a full cousin of Francis Cues and by the time Tom goes on hunger strike Francis Cues is dead so Tom would have known, you know, obviously known that before he was on his hunger strike. Um, and that, I think, in a way, tells you all you need to know about this individual. Um, because uh, and he, he joined the hunger strike in the full knowledge. They all did, but there's particular aspects to each hunger strike which are unique. unique and uh, hunger striker, sorry, which are unique. And certainly the connection between Francis Cues and Tom, familial connection. Um, connection through the struggle, because both of them were in the IRA together, um, operating in the same area of uh, South Derry together, and would have probably shared many Republican moments as well as family moments together. The thing to bear in mind about the prison hospital is that it was a small wing, prison wing, cells on either side and this is where the lads were down on hunger strike inside those cells and uh, Tom McElwee was on the right hand side of, of the wing as you walk up it from the circle and just before just after Tom's cell where Tom died Francis Cues uh, died in that cell so his cousin uh, died some time before him in the cell that he was in next door um, and the families would of course have been aware of all of that as they passed each of these cells so that in a sense it's wonderful that we have that facility now and we'll be able to visit in the fullness of time um, and pay our, our personal tributes to the hunger strikers in each of the prison cells but on this specific day um, when I visited Tom uh, he was in bed um, and he was lucid and not frail but not strong either and uh, but his voice was very strong indeed um, and I remember the conversation at the time was that there was some negotiations there was always negotiations going on around the issue of resolving the hunger strike of one form or another 
Um, but there was some public commentary, I just can't remember now what it was. And I remember uh, Tom's mother and him speaking about um, the, the, the public commentary at the time. And it was quite clear in what he said to his mother, you know, that unless, unless the British government gave uh, the prisoners the five demands which they were on hunger strike for, he wasn't coming off the hunger strike. And it was the way he said, I'm not going back to that place unless I've got the five demands. And it, I've thought about that many, many times over the years, that uh, uh, the tone of his voice, the determination in his voice. And really what it was about, I think, was this horrendous experience. All of the blanket men and the women in Armagh, but certainly the blanket men experienced the brutality they experienced while on the blanket at the hands of the, of, of the prison warders. And when he talked about that place, he really meant that he wanted all of that suffering, all of that brutality and misery to end. And he was standing in the hope that that would end and that he wasn't going to end the hunger strike uh, without that, in other words, the demands being met and the demands would have ended those horrendous conditions that the, um, that the prisoners were in. Um, <clears throat> But also I think, um, when you think of, of the qualities that he had, you could see them in, their, in his parents and in his family, because they, they, they stood by him, and as all the prisoners' relatives did, stood by them um, whenever they decided to, to go on the hunger strike, and decided to see the th hunger strike through to the end. So. The qualities that you see, that I saw in that man lying in that hospital bed, um, and he was dead a few weeks later, uh, were quite remarkable indeed. Quite remarkable. That bravery in, in the face of impending death. And the calmness with which he, 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 he looked into death, I suppose, uh, every day w when he opened his eyes. And um, I think that um, his whole period of imprisonment among his comrades as a leader who stood up for them in the most difficult of circumstances. All of that I think tells you that um, this was a special person with special qualities. Um, determined Republican. And I think it's also important to say that what was going on, that hunger strike, yes it was about the five demands, there's no doubt about that. And had the British government conceded them, no one would have died. But the reality was that, that, that it was also a struggle for United Ireland. And that the men who were down in that hate block, prison wing, were not only down for political status, but they were also down as part of the Republican struggle for United Ireland. And that was what brought them in to the prison. That's what they were fighting for on the outside. And they fought and died for it in the prison hospital as well on Hunger Street. I do not grudge them, Lord, I do not grudge. My two strong sons that I have seen go out to break their strength and die, they and a few in a bloody protest for a glorious thing. They shall be spoken of among their people the generations shall remember them and call them blessed. But I will speak their names to my own heart. In the long nights, the little names that were familiar once, round my dead hearth. Lord, thou art hard on mothers. We suffer in their coming and their going. And though I grudge them not, I weary, weary of the long sorrow, and yet I have my joy. My sons were faithful and they fought. Tommy was a great person, a brilliant personality, funny, but serious at the same time. And 
at that time, he was only a friend. So you could talk to Tommy about anything. And he always seemed to have an answer for you. And as I said, he was great with my brother Eugene. And I would have seen Tommy that way, through him. And um, that's the only way I can describe Tommy. Um, he was very good looking. Uh, sometimes I wonder why they put the photograph in the paper that they did put in because his mother later gave me a photograph of him I have it in the house and he was wearing a brown three-piece suit. He was at a wedding and he had the curly hair, wavy curly hair and I mean he was good looking and it wasn't until um, we both went inside that I really got to know her family. And um, I was went to Armagh, Tommy went to the cash, and we started writing to each other. And that was it, for it complete friendship. But through writing, for wrote for nearly two years, and um, we really got to know one another. It's a bit like these dating apps today, where they date through a computer. We date through letters, right? So at the first trial, and um, with one trial, and we appealed our case. And then we had a second trial months later. And it was at the second trial, months later, that I was, we were all put into, for some reason, they put us all, the eight or nine of us that were up in that case, and um, for some reason they put us all into the one room, which they wouldn't normally do. And it was there that Tommy asked me would I marry him. Now it came as a shock, right? Because we, I know we had got to really know one another. And of course I said yes. And the case was over. And I think that was the day we were, uh, the case we got sentenced, I think that day. And come back then to our ma, and I think the first one I told was Maria Farrell, God rest her. I said, Maria, I'm engaged. And of course they were shocked, right? So again, we continued writing, that was in 77. We continued on writing, and Tommy, he poured his feelings out to you. You had letters coming through the censor, but you also had your comms coming in. And it would have been very political minded. But he was also a very religious person, right? And as I say, we continued writing, until I got a letter in 81 that he was going on a hunger strike. And I shot and not shot, if you know what I mean. So I wrote him back a sniggy and I told him I would stand by whatever he wanted. Right. At that time, you were hoping against hope that. Um, it wouldn't come to any more deaths. You were just hoping against hope. Anyway, Tommy went on the hunger strike and we continue writing. And continue getting our comms and he would have been asking about the woman and our man and I'd have been asking them about the men in the H-Flug. So you were getting to know there are people in the H-Flug I never met, but I nearly, I nearly knew them. Only I can't put a face to them. And anyway, that went on, uh, the writing of the letters. And in, on one of the letters he wrote to me, he said, apply for a visit, right? And sorry, a few weeks before that, my granny had died. And I applied for parole, and they wouldn't give it, right? So Tommy then wrote and asked me to apply for a visit. 
I applied for the visit not thinking I would get it. And on the 7th of August, um, we were getting locked up for the night, right? And anybody that was inside knows that when you're getting locked up, they come round by key and lock you up. Then they come round with a master key, second key, and that goes onto the door. But for some reason that night, they started down on my side of the wing. And I can rem remember the screw as well, Betty, the caller. And she went by my door. She didn't put the master key in. It's me. God, that's funny. And everybody else had their master key on, and the next thing she come and she opened my door. And here she is. By the way, you're for the cash in the morning. And locked up, and I started shouting up to Maria and the rest of the woman in the wing, I'm for the cash in the morning. Come the following morning, I can remember as well, I wore Maria for a suit going to it. And I can remember it as well, uh, getting up and getting dressed and getting the hair fixed, whatever, and going down. Screws come and took me down. And there were one screw in particular. Now, I don't think she wasn't, you would have got good screws and bad screws. You got more bad ones than you did good. And this one in particular turned around and says to me, um, would you like a wee tablet to sell you? And I can remember saying to her, if Tommy McElwee can die in hunger strike, or is prepared to die in hunger strike, surely to God I can go and see him without taking a tablet. Anyway, we got to the cash, and there were a priest there. Now who the priest was, I don't think it was the two priests that normally went in, because this priest, for some reason, I didn't like him. Whatever he said to me, got in, I didn't like him. Anyway, I got in. One screw came in and sat behind me, and there were a medical screw to the right, or to the left hand side of Tommy. <coughs> and I walked in, and to be honest with you, Tommy never had a pile of weight on him. And I expected to see Tommy really, really bad, but I got shot. To me, it wasn't as bad as what I expected him to be, right? So I goes in and sat, sat down in the chair and we started talking small talk. He was asking about the woman and her man, and I was asking about the other ones that were in the hunger strike and about whatever. And I remember the door opening and somebody coming in and saying to the screw behind me, would you like a cup of tea? And Tommy, the plate was sitting beside Tommy. Must have been his breakfast plate. <coughs> and Tommy going to me, I know what I would like. I would like a big steak. And we laughed at that, right? We talked away and then the next thing Tommy said to me, give me a cigarette, right? I went to take the cigarette to give it to Tommy and the male screw, he bounced up and says, he's not allowed that. And Tommy goes, all right. He says, well, I can think of better things to do. And we started a curtain. Now, young ones today would not know what curtain is, so it's either snogging or facing, right? And to me, this, this man's very bright, very lizard. And that was okay. We talked away again about different things. He was asking about my family. And then he says, oh, by the way, and he puts his hand out to the table. And he lifted a tooth. And I says, what's that? He said, that's my tooth. He says, it fell out last night. And to this day, I'm sorry I didn't take that tooth. Probably would have took it off me, off me anyway. And that was, we talked away again, all different things. And then the next thing he left my hand, right? And 
When I got engaged, it was my mother and Tommy's mother had come up to Armagh and brought the ring up. So he lifted my hand and he took the ring off. And I thought to myself, geez, here's he had taken the ring off me now. And he said, I never could do that before. And I won't do it now. Right? And he talked away. The next thing he turned around and he says to me, Dolores, when you're writing, I was a very, you were used when you were writing Sniggies, you had to do the writing very, very small. And I mean, my writing would have been minute. And he says, when you're writing again, he says, do me a favour and do your writing a wee bit bigger. He says, my eyesight's not what it used to be. Visit was over, we got half an hour for the visit. And they come and they said, your visit's over. And Tommy said to me, this is the part I can't, could never understand. Because he was so lucid, uh, he says, now, when you go back again, apply right away for a, a visit, for I'm doing the same thing. And I said to him, right. And good night. He was telling you he loved you. I didn't look back. I spoke from my back and told him I loved him and went out. And we got back to our bar and brought into, of course, the reception or the place where you get searched. Now, I never was out of a screw sight from my head left that morning until I got back to our bar. And I was strip searched. So anyway, that was okay. Went back up onto the wing, and of course the girls all wanted to hear about the visit. I was telling them all about the visit. They then come, the screws come, and said to me, um, "Cell search." And as I say, I never was out of their sight. I'd been, I think, I'd a cell search two or three days before it. <coughs> they come in, they ripped the cell apart, they even turned the wee table upside down. And that was okay. Um, went back in to the rest of the women that were in the, they were all gathered in the one cell beside me. And that was okay, got locked up again that night and the following morning. Um, I think it was around 10 o'clock or that. And I think it was on your Myra's cell that the girls were gathered in, right? And I was in telling them again all about the visit and how Tommy looked. They wanted to know what he said. They wanted all details. Right, and I was in the middle of telling them all this, and for some reason, I had to get out of cell, and I went into my old cell. And I looked, and the time was 19 minutes past 11. Or sorry, 19, 19 minutes past 11. And I cried. And I then went back in to the other cell, started telling, finishing about the visit with Tommy. And it been Saturday, the, a lot of the women had visits. And they were all done getting their showers or their baths or whatever for the visit. <coughs> and 25 past 12, I can remember it as well. <sighs> Maria for all come in. And Maria says, one of the women are after telling me she heard it in the news that Tommy's dead. She says, but don't believe it. Here she says to her, here she says, she could have picked it up wrong. Right. So you get locked up at half twelve, 
to have one, I think it was for your lunch. And my cell door was locked, and about five minutes later, the door opened again, and it was Father Murray. And as soon as I seen him, I knew. And Father Murray says, Dolores, I'm sorry. And he says, the only thing is, I'm not going to be here. He was going away in some conference that day. And that was okay. You just shed your tears. And I applied for parole to go to the funeral. And of course, I was turned out. Right. So it'd been the weekend. You were not getting very much news because during the week you would have day TV news or whatever, but being a Saturday and a Sunday, you were getting no news whatsoever. And Tommy was getting buried on the Monday. And That afternoon, my mother, and I think it had to be Peggy, the sister, she was a taxi driver, and my other sister, Jane, came up that afternoon. And my mother had two flowers with her that she'd taken of Tommy's grave. And they're there. And on the back of it, it's written, Flowers from Tommy McRae's breath, 10th of the 8th, 81. Brought to me by my mother to our jail on the 10th, and dried and framed by Maria McLean. And I do believe that Maria dried them inside the Bible. So that would have suited Tommy. So, Tommy, Let's fix. Thinking back on Tommy, how do you feel about it? It's, it was their wish to go on the hunger strike. It was their wish not to be taken off it. And how can you deny any hard? Had to be very, very hard on Tommy and Frank Smuller and Fowler. Not to be able to respect their wishes and not take them off the hunger strike. But I always said that Maggie Thatcher wanted a pound of flesh, and by God did she get it. To ten, but she didn't realise how strong the men in the cash were. She thought once the first one died, that was it. She didn't realise that the men were prepared to come behind the other and stand up for what they believed. And that is what Tommy and Frank believed in. And I would tell my son, my son keeps tell, saying to me, Mommy, you have to tell me all about that. He's 31, you'd think he was away in. He's 31, married and a child of his own. But he can't wait. I have always promised him I would write the story out a bit. Tommy. And he kept asking me, Mommy, I thought you were to write it out. And he can't wait to see this video and hear the story about Tommy. And he would love Tommy. So he would. 
I'm not Frank. <laughs>